Okay, I think uh, we might begin, um, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Um, welcome uh, to the, the uh, Marjorie Benningfield Taylor Annual Lecture. Um, Miss Taylor, I mean, it's no introduction for me, especially as I actually never knew her. Um, but uh, just to remind you, uh, although Fiona has put the essential fact already on the slide, uh, Miss Taylor more or less ran this society for the first 50 years of its existence. Um, and she edited the Journal of Roman Studies from, um, I myself had sort of sometime in the 1920s right up until the 60s, where we now have the actual dates. Um, an extraordinary thing when you think now uh, editorship of the JRS is a sentence of uh, at most five years. Um, Miss Taylor uh, ran the, uh, the society and the journals, and she kept the professors in order. Um, she, uh, in those days, there was no, um, no peer review or anything like that. There was an editorial committee, but everyone knew that if you wanted to get an article into the JRS, you had to get it past Miss Taylor, and her standards were exacting. And it was she who made it what it still is today, that is, the premier English language journal in the field of Roman studies. Um, and the lecture in her honour requires um, a speaker who would be able to meet Miss Taylor's exacting standards. <laughs> and we're very fortunate today um, to have Mireille Cordier, who um, you actually elected uh, a few years ago to the post of honorary member of the Roman Society, a very select group of 12 distinguished overseas scholars. Um, because uh, Professor Corbier is uh, an extremely distinguished scholar in uh, all uh, a very wide range of uh, fields within Roman studies. Um, it would take far too long to read out all her many distinctions. I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, she has been the director of the Anne Epigraphique uh, since the early 1990s and continues to be so. Um, uh, something for which we are all in her debt. Um, and uh, she also, um, a year ago, was elected president of our sister society, I think I can call it the Société des Etudes Latines. Um, we're very pleased to welcome her today. Her, her research, as I say, covers a very wide range. Um, if you say, what does she specialise in? I mean, she began, she made her name with uh, a Thais uh, published uh, by the Ecole Française de Rome, on uh, the Irarium Saturni and the Irarium Militare, a prosperographical study of the prefects of, of the treasury, uh, but also um, taking her into the fields of, um, of economy, taxation, and uh, what we have to call now, um, using the French term, fiscalité. Uh, she has also uh, studied uh, literacy, um, the use of writing in private context, in particular um, family reproduction in Roman society and the uses of adoption, um, uh, food production, agriculture, diet, uh, almost uh, the whole field of Roman social history comes within her purview. So if you say, what does she specialise in, I can only say uh, the promotion of Roman studies. So it's entirely appropriate that uh, she is here today. And it's a great honour and privilege to be able to introduce to you Mireille Corbier. It is an honour and privilege for me. Well, my title is Practices of Birthday Celebration in At Rome. In a recent book entitled La Pension de l'Anniversaire, the medieval historian Jean Claude Schmidt demonstrates that the birthday anniversary seems to have been unknown in the Western Middle Ages only to reappear between the 14th and 16th centuries and further develop in Europe between the 17th and 19th centuries. The custom of the birthday cake 
decorated with candles, which has become widespread recently, above all for children, is first attested for Goethe's 50th birthday. This encourages us to revisit what we know of festivities organized in the Roman world to celebrate each year on a fixed date an event understood as being the birthday of a given person identified with that name, but also the day of certain other events, such as the accession to power in the case of the ruler. That is a festival that we call today in French an anniversaire, but which English and German, for example, distinguish as the birthday or Geburtstag from the birth of other events susceptible to being celebrated. I will aim to demonstrate for all not only what we know of the rituals and concrete practices of these celebrations, as well as their evolution over time, but also differences and similarities with what has been gradually established in Western European culture over the last five or six centuries. <coughs> Lifespan begins on the day of birth. The Dies Natalis observes the grammarian and philosopher Sensorinus, who in the early 3rd century put together a little book entitled De Die Natali. The Dies Natalis designating, in this case, the day of the anniversary of one's birth. It is therefore the event of birth, and more broadly, the the entry of the infant child into its family and society that we shall take as a starting point of our following inquiry into the annual celebration of someone's birth before looking subsequently at individuals' private celebrations and then more briefly at the public festivities tied to the Emperor's Dies Natalis that appeared under Augustus. Finally, we shall discuss the reversal of the situation attributable to Christianity, whereby the term natalis was applied to the anniversary of a person's death. A reversal that was not complete because the Christian emperors continued to celebrate the anniversary of their birthday as well as the anniversary of their accession as a public festival. The entry of the child into the family and society. For a long time now, historians and jurists, and in their wake, anthropologists, have considered a child's recognition to be expressed immediately after its birth by a ritual and cultural act on the part of the Roman father, consisting for him in holding up the newborn child placed on the ground in order to signify the entry of the infant into the family group. The, this traditional interpretation has been challenged by the classical philologist Thomas Kölbus Zulauf, who has put the reality of the gesture itself in doubt. From his collecting of the sources and his close analysis of them, he deduced that the expression tolere suscipere infantem does not refer back to any specific ceremony involving the father. The confusion may have arisen among modern scholars between, on the one hand, hand the actions of the midwife, putting the newborn down on the ground so that it would let out its first cry, examining it to, the, to check its health, then picking, picking it back up again in order to cut the umbilical cord, and, on the other hand, the father's decision to accept a child into the family. The first scene is described with precision by the physician Soranos of Ephesus. For the raising up from the ground, it is the midwife who received the support of a specialized deity, Levana, whose name Augustine transmits 
taken from Varro. We are encouraged by this rigorous philological study to deny the reality of the ritual, which moreover is not attested iconographically. <coughs> the scene symbolizing births that does feature on child sarcophagi from the beginning of the second century AD onwards is that of the newborn's first bath, is that a scene that is also common in Roman art in representations of the infancy of Dionysus and of Achilles until late antiquity. The presentation of the newborn to his mother features notably on, on a restored sarcophagus in the Louvre where the basin is missing but not a servant girl holding up a towel intended to dry or wrap around the infant. These scenes, of which there are a number of examples, recall the life of the deceased from birth to death and emphasize the weight of the destiny by the frequent presence of, in the background of the three fates. One of these, with her staff, points out the newborn sign of the zodiac on the celestial, on the celestial sphere while another writes on a scroll. For Cicero, the birth dates does seem to increase faith in the predictions of personal destiny. Let us agree that, for an infant, the disposition of the heavens had some importance at the moment when it took its first breath. The course of destiny does not seem inevitable, however, if the genius to which we will return, has the power to moderate the natale astrum, according to Horace, and if the sacrifices offered to the gods in order to assure their goodwill can delay the fatal outcome, according to Varro, a benefit that one might expect only up to the age of 70, for after that the sacrifice no longer has effect. And for me, it's too late. The moment of birth, represented by the first bath, is also evoked by the mother goddesses of Berto near Dijon. The goddess on the right, oh no, this is the, first, the same uh, with the celestial sphere and, uh, and, and, and the park. Um, up. Well, um, <coughs> the mother of goddesses of Berto, uh, the goddess on the right holds a dish and a sponge, the one in the middle unfurls a towel, the one on the left holds the quadrant newborn on her knees. But these images of the first ministrations given <coughs> to the newborn also permit a reading charged with symbolic meaning with a patera for libation and an unrolled volumen, the Book of Destiny. We find again here this link already mentioned between birth and death. The decision to bring up the newborn is, in practical terms, taken by its being breastfed by its mother or by a wet nurse. From the moment of birth, the parents naturally rejoiced in the happy deliverance of the mother and in the arrival of the newborn. They decorated the entrance of the house with garlands and received congratulations from friends. An announcement could be made on the outside, on the outside, um, <laughs> on the outside of the house at Pompeii, that of the birth of little Eumenilla dates in all likelihood to the year 79, written in charcoal only a few months before the eruption of Vesuvius, it has not faded away. It in, you, there is not the, the line I am reading now. It indicates the precise date, the 2nd of August, the day of the week, 
Saturday and the hour, the second hour of the night. The graffito name contains a drawing of a baby inside a, its cradle. Those who are born in the 24 hours running from midnight to midnight have the same yes natalis, specifies Sensorinus. The memory of the exact day when they were born explains the frequent mention in the epitaphs of young children of the number of years, of months and of days that they had lived. The well-known visit of the philosopher Favorinus of ours to a man of high birth whose young wife has, been be, has just been delivered is recounted by Paulus Julius, who was an eyewitness to it. The friends did not hold back on their compliments. One of them must have been common. The child is the portrait, the imago, as we know, of his father and bears witness to the virtue <coughs> of his mother. After the day of birth, the lustral day, the lustricus, combined the purification of the household and the giving of a name to the newborn. This day is mentioned by Tertullian among family festivals under the name of Solemnitas Nominalium. This celebration came after a delay determined by tradition. There was no advantage in bringing it forward. The infant did not survive uh, its first week. The infant uh, that did not survive its first week had no legal existence. The distinction according to the sex of the newborn of the eighth day for daughters and of the ninth for boys was probably intended to mark the gender difference. Plutarch sought to explain it in his Questiones Romani, but for lack of time, who will never know. The words uttered by persons present could have the power of prediction and the choice of the name was not, therefore, a matter of indifference for the child's destiny. In contrast with today's practice, the birth declaration attested for Roman citizens under the empire for boys and girls is differentiated from the name giving and came after it. It was required to take place during the 30 days that followed the nomination. Nevertheless, it is from the name given that the Roman state recognized the existence of the child and not from the moment of the declaration of its birth. One finds the birth of each individual divided into four dates, delivery and the decision to raise a newborn by nursing it at the private, at the private level, nomination and declaration of birth at the public level. The anniversary of the day of birth. If a one-year-old child, the little Aniculus or Anicula, merits its own specific designation, that does not mean that a celebration was made of his first birthday. But for Egypt, we have at least one invitation written on the papyrus to come to celebrate it, and we shall see it. The parents must have rejoiced that their child had crossed the threshold of the threshold of the first year, such a risky period for all young children and above all, particularly the union Latins, for whom the child survival offered the promise of obtaining Roman citizenship. In the course of his long expose of the calendar reform of Caesar, who, in order to harmonize the civil year with the sun's course, added sometimes two days, sometimes one day to the month, to reach the ten extra days necessary, Sensorinus added. He placed these days at the end of the month, this assuredly in order to avoid the displacement of religious ceremonies from their proper dates in each month. Taking pl place once a year, like all religious festivals, the anniversary of a person's birth, birth fell, like them, 
on a particular day, on, of a particular month, which for numerous Romans born before the year 45 BC of the Reform, had to be recalibrated. So the birthday of Augustus himself and of Livia. The celebration of this day, Dies Natalis, is a private custom attested already in the comedies of Plautus and of Terence, which suggests that it was known and practiced by, practiced by a portion of the audience at home and in an urban context, at least. It is sharply distinguished from modern usages in multiple respects, to begin with the fact that the person concerned celebrated their own birthday, even if one might also celebrate that of a loved one. The birthday anniversary traditionally presents the opportunity to invite some relative and but also some friends to a festive meal. The now famous letter of invitation from Claudia Severa to her friend Sulpicia Lepidina, preserved on one of the Bindelanda tablets, specifies the, de the date and the reason for a day of celebration, my birthday. And this the, the papyrus uh, with the text in French. The little book, De Die Natali, is itself precisely the birthday present offered by Saint Sorinus to his protector and benefactor. This custom of celebrating the birthday anniversary of a protector or of a friend by offering them a work of literature or by composing it in their honor had begun in effect more than two centuries previously with the poets of the Augustan period. They had created and made famous the literary genre of the Genetliacon, which had no precedent in Greek. The meal that was offered on the day of the birthday anniversary to the relatives and friends, and to some hazards also we shall see, is always a central element of the private celebration and remains so notably in the works of the Christian Sidonius Apollinaris at a time when it had lost its religious dimension. It is, however, not the essence of the traditional Roman celebration. At home, celebrating, celebrating one's birthday is, first and foremost, a religious ritual dedicated by the person concerned to a divinity that is also a Roman invention, the genius. Genius should, according to Georges Dumézil, designate the deification of the personality of each individual. In the place of Plautus, the genius is the essential life force of the individual. It rejoices overall in eating well. But in Horace, the inspiration for Sensorinus, the genius becomes a companion, comes for each of us, whence later on its Christian transformation into our guardian angel. The genius, while Sensorinus, is a guardian at our side, so attentive that it never leaves our side for an instant, but then, having taken charge of us from the moment we left our mother's belly, it accompanies us right up to the last day of our life. There, once again, one finds this fundamental link between the two limits of the lifespan, the first and the last day, which implies a celebration and even the conception of the death natalis. In the representations depicted in the wall paintings of Pompeii, the genius has a human figure, but its divinity is recognized by an attribute, the cornucopia, and this um, is quite singular. This is the domina, and the dominus represented as his genius. Um, the appellation of you know for the genius of a female person, well attested for example in Pliny the Elder, should be a creation of the Augustan period, but this you know remains rarely mentioned in epigraphy. 
as for Natalie's birthday anniversary, it could also be personified and it earns them the epithet of Candidus. Maybe glorious. This happy day should be marked by a white stone and the celebrant before the altar, himself dressed in white, performs a sacrifice and utters vows in the presence of his familia, who assembles there in silence. The altar is festooned with flowers and the sacrifice consists of the burning of grains of incense, the offering of honey cakes, and libations of undiluted wine. It is not customary, as in Sorinus, for his part, citing to this effect vow, to commemorate the birthday with a blood sacrifice. Also the fact that the oaths of Horace celebrate anniversaries with a mention of such sacrifices, with as victims, in one case a piglet, in another a lamb, has given rise to comment. For Robert Schilling, Horace's remarks correspond to ancient tradition practiced above all in the rural milieu, whereas the testimony of Barrow was referring to, referring to a more, more recent attitude inspired by philosophy, the only recent, the only one attests their heart. This memorable day might be chosen for another personal celebration. Thus Pompey retained it for the celebration of his triumph in 61. The coinciding of the anniversaries of event considered as lucky much, was much sought after, as so this coincidence brought with it a bonus. And the coincidence of date were readily emphasized. Cicero twice observes that the date of his daughter birthday, that of the Roman temple of Salus, and that of the colony of Brennusium coincided with that of the day of his return to Italy from exile. So yes, Natalis is a happy day that one could hope to celebrate at home and in complete tranquility, but the ancient authors do not fail to emphasize uh, in contrary cases, the sad coincidence with unhappy events. Cassius, for example, suffered defeat at Philippi and committed suicide on that day. A father or mother does not fail to signal in his epitaph that their son died precisely on the day of their birthday. To be arrested at home in mid-celebration, to be accused and condemned for maestas, redoubles the injustice suffered. When this day is not felt by the person concerned to be festive, it is that the circumstances surrounding it are sad. Thus, for Ovid, who celebrated his birthday in exile in Thomas, and for Cicero, who writes from Brindisi to his close friend Atticus, when he has been compelled to flee, I write to you on the day of my birthday, ah, if only that day I could have known not to be born. Seen in a positive light, the natalis of close family, relatives and friends becomes as important as one's own. <coughs> for us, Right. A propos of the Ides of April, a day that is for me rightly solemn and more sacred almost than my own birthday. For from this day, my dear Mekenas counts the years flowing in. Further, further confirmation, one does not even imagine that dear ones distant from you could fail to celebrate your birthday at the same time as you. This is the theme of the letter of Augustus, reproduced by Aulus Julius, to his grandson Gaius Caesar, then in Syria, on the day of his 64th birthday. The mention of age is rare in works dedicated to birthdays. It appears above all when the beliefs of the period judged that point of life to be dangerous to pass what was called a climacteric age. This is the case for Augustus, 
who rejoiced to be over the age of 63, nine times seven. And this, it is a fact that Ovid from exile in Thomas celebrates the natalis of his wife and that of Augustus. But one could also commemorate the births of famous men of the past whose memories were worshipped. Juvenal recalls the old wine that, according to him, Frasea and Antidus, senators loyal to Republican ideology, drank, festooned with flowers on the birthday of the Bruti and of Cassius. A whole system of rules was thus created around these remote celebrations, comprising incentives and customs, obligations and innovations, but also prohibitions, numerous examples of which contemporaries, contemporaries are recorded and transmitted to us. One other peculiarity comes as something of a surprise to us, that is the formulation of the wishes themselves. In celebrating the birthday of a friend or relative, one says to them, your birthday is ours or more dear to me than my own, and so say Horace, Marshall, Pliny the Younger, and others. Marcus Aurelius, when he was not yet emperor, composed a note for his master Fronto that was full of exuberance. I know that it is customary on a friend's birthday to wish him good things. Nevertheless, I, who love you as much as myself, want to pray on your birthday only for myself. He invokes one by one a series of divinities. I ask them to favor of celebrating with you the day when we were born for my benefit. There is a third distinctive feature of the Roman Natalis. Some people commemorated a dead person on the anniversary of their birthday or set up a funerary foundation so that the Natalis might continue to be celebrated for themselves or for a close relative after their death either by their civic community or, most often, by an association, with the help of interest or revenues from a capital sum or landed property bequeathed to this end, to the coffers of the city or association in order to enable them to be spent making this day one to remember. The festivities most commonly envisaged were either an epulum, a collective sacrificial meal offered to all or a portion of the citizenry or members of the association, <laughs> or the distribution of a sum of money per capita, or sometimes both, the division taking place during the meal. The gift of food could be quite modest, a simple custulum of mousse, or distributions of bread, wine, and calda, hot water, to dilute the wine. We are not at all short of examples of cities or, or associations who, in thanks for funerary foundations, also rise the setting up of a statue of the deceased, and this even more willingly, because the family usually takes on the cost of it. Or have set up uh, uh, themselves um, the statue thanks to a collection in the case of association. The institutionalization of larges at the behest of the deceased, but also in some cases of one of their relatives, friends, clients, or freedmen, thus assured the perpetuation of the celebration in the form chosen. In some rare cases, we find the establishment of a private cult. Through the regulations of associations, honorific inscriptions engraved on statue bases, funerary monuments were extracted from wills are cited, the epigraphic testimony of arrangements made to commemorate the death natalis of so and so can be counted by the dozens in Italy and the western provinces where the elites had adopted Roman customs. 
also draft in the same spirit, they are personalized and take various forms. Some people provided a double commemoration, namely one for their birthday and another for the annual festivals of the dead, the Parentalia and the Rosalia. Let us therefore stress this close association between the commemoration of the birthday and the annual commemoration of the deceased at a fixed date, which is the day of the dead and not the day of their death. There are two commemorations. These are two commemorations that are for us completely dissociated. This dissociation allows us to a most profound shift in the very understanding of lifespan, which for us is invested from the beginning with a potentially positive content and not placed from the outset under the shadow of its inescapable end. So this Natalis of the Emperor, a public festival, a new evolution occurred with a change in political regime in that the civic calendar gradually came to include various festival days, yes, festi, dedicated to the emperor, to the members of the fam his family, and to important events of his political and family life. We find here again the invention of something that tended thereafter to become a tradition. An innovation that was very rapid, a few decades under the reigns of Augustus and Tiberius were enough, while the tradition persisted through the centuries. The genius of the living Augustus became a tutelary deity. From the time of Augustus onwards, the anniversary of the birth of the emperors became, in effect, a public festival marked both by sacrifices in the form of immolation and then consumption of animal victims offered to the principal gods of Rome and by various other festivities. In any case, the anniversary of the birth of Augustus is the earliest attestation of a personal yes natalis featuring in the calendars and this when he was still alive. The origin of the celebration goes as far back as this time, just after the victory of Axion. The Senate decreed in 30 BC that the supplicatio would take place on the date of Augustus' birth, the, the 23rd of September, therefore. Very soon, the magistrates, Aedilus and Praetors, had associated with it a sacrificial banquet, Epulum, and public shows, Circenses and Venationes. The stage had been thoroughly identified and studied, thanks to the abundance of documentation, notably that of the fasti that were engraved and displayed in the towns in the vicinity of Rome, in imitation of it, calendar <coughs> flooded with a profusion of new festivities. It is a subject that is well known to all of you and served to a huge bibliography. Among the most unexpected innovations for us is the adoption by a decree of the Coinon of Asia, prompted by the Proconsul, of the 23rd of September, as the beginning of the year, and as the day of entry into office of the magistrates for all the cities of the province. Here I want to have a particular thought for Simon, Simon Price, who was a good friend of me. In Italy, a complicated municipal inscription from Forum Claudi to De Bracciano uh, shows clearly the choice of Natales, of Augustus, and of Tiberius for the immolation of sacrificial victims and the invitation to re et vino of their respective genie to come and participate in the meal. This day of the 23rd of September is that of the Julian calendar, which was not in use 
at the time of the birth of Augustus in 63. According to one hypothesis, Augustus was born precisely on the day of the festival of Apollo and would intentionally have preserved his birthday on the same day. And he himself advertised, notably via a coin issue, the zodiac sign he had chosen, the Capricorn, which became a long-standing point of reference. It appeared not only on coins, here an uh, Aurelius from Spain, and here Sisto uh, for, from Ephesus, uh, but also on gems, as the gem Augustia, on diverse monuments, so, so at Antioch of Pisidia, on the frieze of an arch belt under Augustus, uh, the Capricorn is here, and on funerary and commemorative monuments of soldiers. This um, in, in Korn, um, the funerary monument of soldiers. And uh, oh, yes, the second legend, Augusta, which had been reformed after the civil wars and which was stationed in Britain from the conquest and took part in the construction of the Admin's Wall and the Antonine Wall, preserved as well as the name of Augustus as his epithet, its epithet, Capricorn as the emblem of his vexillum. This one one and just more beautiful because it's also the eagle of the legend and the captive, uh, and the Capricorn, half goat and half fish, it's in the middle. In his Latin translation of the phenomena of Aratos, Germanicus uses some imagination and says to Augustus, Augustus dead, it is him, the Capricorn, who carried to the heaven and gave back to the maternal stars your divine soul inside the sign of your birthday. One observes, though later, the adoption of a near identical practice for Livia, initially in a discreet and official manner. Uh, uh, Natal is one of the, for example, chosen for the dedication of Arapatis. But we have no time to develop that. Under the Flavians onwards, the principle of these public celebrations was entrenched. For example, the Flavian municipal law confirmed, confirmed the existence, besides several other feriae, of festival days tied to the veneration of the Domus Augusta. In this case, they concern only members of the Flavian imperial Flamini. The, access, the, the accession of the emperor, yes, in Perry, which Vespasian had chosen to celebrate on the day of his affirmation by the soldiers at Alexandria, the 1st of July 1669, is among them. Under the Antonines, the practice of celebrating the two official imperial festivals, Dies Natalis and Dies Imperi, became a fixed feature. From Bikin and the governor Pliny does not fail to send the wishes expected in these two circumstances, nor try to reply. The imperial festival became so commonplace as to be integrated in the private festivals of the guild. At Rome, under Hadrian, the generous benefactor of a guild of artisans, provided for the annual distribution to each of the members of cash gifts and the serving of bread, of, of, bread, of wine, and of calda in January on Hadrian's Dies Natalis, and a dinner Sena Recta, and the distribution of cash gifts in August on Hadrian's Dies Imperi, but also distributions on the day of his own birth, his own birthday, and that of his son. The connectivity of association life to imperial power has been recently emphasized. 
Publicly celebrated feast days could similarly be chosen as special dates for the dedication of mo monuments and statues. In this regard, Christopher Bruin has exploited the plentiful epigraphic corpus of Ostia. That the day chosen for the dedication of a statue of Marcus Aurelius in AD 140, recorded by the Farsi Ostiensis, should be the 24th of April, death natalis of the future emperor, seems logical. But in 173, a guild of boatmen dedicated an edific an honorific statue to his patron on the 19th of September, which we find to be the natalis of Antoninus Pius, who had died nearly ten years late, earlier. Only the army could have employed a uniform ritual calendar updated by the central power and distributed to all the military camps dispersed across the empire. At least, this is what several military historians have deduced from the example known as the Feriale Duranum, written on a papyrus found in the archives of the court of Panirenes, stations at Dura Europos on the Euphrates during the reign of Severus Alexander. The soldiers were required to <coughs> sacrifice specific animal victims cattle whose meat they consumed, which was certainly the most festive side of the celebration on the occasion of the very numerous festival days. Note that whereas the natalis of the living emperor and on every divus is marked by an animal sacrifice, a simple supplicatio suffices for a diva. Among those features, the birthday of the Germanicus, grand grandson of Augustus and Tiberius' adoptive son, who died young in 1980 and who was nevertheless not a divus. A festival that offers us an example of a military celebration of very long persistence. Another form of rejoicing for the soldiers was as follows. At the end of the 3rd century, under the occasion, the, the Dies Natalis and the Dies Imperii were two dates when a significant bonus was distributed to them, a monetary donativum, as we know from the Panopolis Papyri. In the calendar of AD 354, illustrated by Philocalus, and maybe since the Tetrarchy, the anniversary of the ruler was no longer called the Dies Imperii, but Natalis abbreviated N. It means precisely the day of his designation as a Caesar. On this day, the new Caesar left the world of ordinary men and was born into that of the Augusti. In the same calendar, there continue to feature among the traditional festivals the birthdays of those emperors of the 1st and 2nd centuries who had obtained consecration from the Senate and then and thus become deep. But in the Christian section of the same calendar, there appears another natalis, that of Christ, celebrated on the 25th of December. Participation in the festivities linked to the imperial anniversary, anniversaries posed a problem for Christians until the point that the constitution of Constantine dispensed with them for the future. In the 4th century, as Christianization pro progressively pervaded the civic calendars, the celebration of the two imperial anniversaries was preserved. So a law of Theodosius I, which recognized the list of days of public festivals, preserved the feast of the calends of January, the anniversaries of the foundations of the two capitals, Rome and Constantinople, and specifies, <coughs> in addition, one should celebrate the days that are dedicated to us, those on which we saw the light of day and on which we began our reign. And the sacrifices previously associated with these festival days, which without becoming Christian feasts, no, uh, kept their status of as public festivals were henceforth 
forbidden. In contrast, the public shows, the Ludi Theatrales, the Equorum Tertabina, named as such in several laws, retain their position in full for the purpose of preserving the Laetitia to which the people had a right and they were secularized by losing all their religious connotations. Nevertheless, at the behest of the G.B. shops, these shows, referred to under the name of Voluptates, were forbidden on a Sunday, the Lord's Day. If the festival of an imperial anniversary fell on a Sunday, the corresponding celebrations were transferred to another day. The anniversary of the Emperor's birthday is found still being celebrated in the Byzantine period in Constantinople in the 10th century. Or, at least, the protocol for observing that day is featured in the Book of Ceremonies of Constantine Porphyregentus. The core of the ceremony is an official banquet in the palace at which the dignitaries, robed in full apparel, are entertained. The Christian Revolution The Christian emperors had therefore continued to celebrate the anniversary of their birthday with banquets and shows, without always designating it in Latin as Natalis. For the meaning of the word Natalis had been turned on its head. For Christians, it had become the day of death, more precisely that of their passion for <coughs> parties and of, and of their deposition for the majority of the deceased. Why did Christians invert the meaning in this way? Tertullian might have been the first to explain it, inciting the legend of the phoenix reborn from the ashes and for whom the end is a birth. The bishop, Cyprian, advises taking note of the day of the death of the martyrs because on this anniversary the Eucharist is celebrated in their memory. It is specifically a propos of the veneration of the martyr Cyprian that Augustine compares the day of his birth with that of his death. On the former, he contracted original sin. On the latter, he overcame all sins. Christian usage transformed the meaning of the word natalis from biological birth to corporeal death, understood as the birth to eternal life. It's a series of poems that he composed for St. Felix of Nola, Paulinus, Bishop of Nola, deliberately, deliberately used the word natalis in this sense. In the, so, in the Christian epitaphs, the death date of death was regularly into, engraved for the first time. It, it was never done before. On the base of the statue of Publius Aelius Apollinaris, set up at Prenes by the grateful Collegiati, we learn that a young man, dead under Constantine, probably, at the age of 18, had asked his father to make a gift of a fundus to the guilds of the city to celebrate the anniversary of his birth and that of his death with annual convivia, something that is not at all customary and, uh, and probably and probably the whole text identified this young man as a Christian. But the reference to convivia, these banquets that had a central role in the activities of the Collegia, remains key. From the ranges of examples evoked there clearly emerges, emerges one other distinctive feature of the Roman celebration of the Dies Natalis. These are the displays of larges, foodstuff, money, shows, to selected persons and social categories. For us today, it is the person celebrating their birthday who receive birthday presents and not the reverse. And it is again for him and or her that one 
comes to leave flowers at their grave on All Souls Day. The reversal in the initiators of this act turns on its head the Roman memorial practice of an act of public generosity offered by the deceased person themselves or one of their close family. The diversity and geographical distribution of this attestation should not lead us to imagining that has them as a universal phenomenon. The benefactors do not belong to the lowest social classes of the population. These men and women have property and frequently occupy a superior position in their city or association, which turns the public distribution into a form of social obligation for them. This systematic survey purports to rapid and this putting into perspective of what recent and or, or older researchers have taught us about the celebration of the Natalis in the Roman world allow us to take stock of the distance that separates behind the apparent formal similarities between practices and sometimes in the terms used the Roman understanding of time and of the relationship between that and the life of individuals from that which has become ours. Two relationships that have never ceased to, to evolve and to give way to more or less profound innovations and transformations. The spread of Christianity at first spontaneous and imposed by imperial authority came to rupture the understanding of the lifespan by giving radically new meaning to death, that of a new birth. Because of this, the anniversary of birth lost a part of its importance for more than a millennium in Europe. Between the 19th century and the 20th century, our societies, encouraged by public registration, must have rediscovered the birthday and with it new practices of celebration, behaviors originating with upper classes and attracting the attention of historians. This year, Michel Perrault has written a wonderful book about George Sand. And um, this, um, this, this practice spread among the lower classes during the 20th century and only, and above all for children. Sociologists interested in it, analyzing the impact of these new festivities, see in the social interactions of children the other side of the coin. Those children who do not have the means to bring the required present or to return the invitation are themselves excluded. But it is always easier to study developments in our own cultures. But I am fully conscious that going further in an approach that should be comparative would mean expanding our coverage to what historians of key cultural themes and anthropologies can teach us about other civilizations past and present, those also needing to be surveyed over a very long durée. But this would be a different story. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a really wonderful um, evocation of a of a society where uh, the practice of celebrating birthdays um, is far more developed than I must say I have realised. Um, and I find myself, um, now I'm going to ask, a, I, I really ought to be asking you to ask questions, but I can't resist, um, asking a question of whether 
other ancient cultures had anything similar? I mean, in, in the Greek world, for instance. Uh, in the Greek world, uh, it was, uh, they had the daimones, but it is not mm. uh, the same as uh, the genius. And um, they never, uh, they, uh, they never celebrate uh, the birthdays. Only the Hellenistic kings uh, uh, had that because uh, they imitated the Persian kings and uh, the Oriental kings, um, kings and so on. But it could be a, f a familiar uh, festival, probably that at least <laughs> in Egypt. In the beginning of the third century, this was his father who invited Fred yes. to celebrate the, the, the first year uh, of his young uh, daughter. But we, we cannot have the same thing for the Western countries, so we do not know if, uh, if sometimes they did. Uh, mm. it's difficult. But well, uh, in, other, in other cultures, uh, uh, there are. Um, huh, not so other, but there is something very um, uh, funny, I can say, um, uh, because I, I ask to all my friends from different countries, and what do they do for yes. the birthday and so on? Know, in China, nothing. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's not so huge. But uh, we had uh, friends, um, good friends, uh, had dinner coming from Mexico, and of, four, of course I said, and what about a uh, birthday in uh, Mexico? And they said that the most interesting is that the ex-president, uh, uh, what's his name, um, help me, uh, Porfirio Diaz, who is so famous, and he has his tomb in Montparnasse uh, um, Cemetery in Paris. Porfirio Diaz, at the beginning of the, 19th, of the 19th century, has chosen the date of the National Festival of Mexico. And it is still the same, 15th of September. And it was his it birthday. Was <laughs> <laughs> it was his birthday. I am sure that in um, different parts of the world we could, uh, yes. uh, we could hear that. Let me open this. Yes. Yeah. If normally with Roman traditions, as you're I'm sure you know, is uh, sorry. In normal traditions, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, Romans, if they didn't take an idea from the, the Greeks, they almost certainly took it from the Etruscans. Did they get the birthday idea from either the Etruscans or some of the other Latin tribes in Italy that they conquered? The problem is is our problem as ancient historians that. When we have no sources, we cannot invent them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I am sure that we have no source about that. So, what to say? Uh, what is the origin? Uh, you have seen that our origin was Plautus in the third century, but maybe first they yeah. have done that, who knows? Who knows? Only asked because the gents in the families are important in Rome, and I know the Etruscans had great attached great links to their families. That's where you have family mausoleums and tombs of the Etruscans with the mm. famous names. I just thought it might have something, but ah, maybe I shall ask to Dominique Briquet, and if he does not find a document, a source, he can write it. <laughs> oh, I wait for <laughs> wise counsel. Thank you. Um, it, it doesn't. I presume um, this art is on. It's, it's not a microphone. It's it's to record. Ah, which, sorry. It <laughs> um, right. Um, you mentioned about Augustus celebrating his birthday, and I wondered whether there are any pre-Augustan political figures who celebrated their birthdays in a public or quasi-public manner. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I have no time for that, but uh, uh, the Triumviri uh, uh, in 42, after the murder of Caesar, had decided that Caesar's, Natalie Caesar's birthday would be celebrated and people were constrained to do that. But I think it has not gone no alone. But uh, for Caesar, of course, uh, we have 
the Natalis of Caesar as Deus Caesar after his death on the same calendars, <coughs> on the same calendars. But uh, uh, for a living person, the first, uh, the first attestation or the public celebration is for Augustus. But we have invented so many things. And I am, I've been surprised because you know that Mussolini had ce celebrated his, his birthday in uh, um, um, 1927, uh, 30, uh, 37. Mm. It was uh, his birthday. And uh, in um, three years, five years ago, six years ago, all the Roman historians uh, thought that it was necessary to celebrate the death of Augustus. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been a lot of conferences and books on the subject. I don't like so much Augustus. <laughs> I, I did not think it was so really necessary. <laughs> but in our discipline, it is true that when you have a range of documents, of course, people are interested in studying them. Yes. Of course, we now live in a culture where people celebrate anniversaries and uh, centenaries of absolutely everything. I mean, the, the celebration <laughs> a few years ago for Augustus was uh, his death. I mean, <laughs> um, last year we were talking about Germanicus. <laughs> in this society. Who's next? Well, quite. Yes, I mean, this is this is part of, uh, of, of the way we do things. And, yes. I mean, 2020, you know, immediately all the media organizations are trying to find anniversaries of something or other. I like that much. Germanicus birthday because yeah. it is the same as Queen Victoria's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. Oh. <laughs> That's what you know. <laughs> yes, it's exactly what I remember. The only reason I remember it. <laughs> yes. Since we're talking about the accessions of emperors to the imperial power, it is the 1922 anniversary of Trajan's accession to power today. Just so I'll is throw it? that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since he's considered to be one of the best emperors, yes, probably better than Augustus in many ways, I think today's a brilliant day to deliver your speech, really. So I'm sure they would have been celebrating throughout the empire today yes. in a very, very big way. So. My observation. Thank you. No, thank you very much. But we enjoy celebrating everything. Yes. Yes, again, please. Um, the painting that you show from the House of Sertoria Primigenia um, with the sacrifice or uh, votive and all the Oh, the, the image? Uh, around, yeah. Yeah. Ah, but uh, if you have... Uh, how how uh, do you know it's a birthday celebration? No, not at all. Yeah. But uh, 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 it is a celebration by the pater familias and his wife and the other one who is precisely... You have an image of what could happen uh, in, in the house with the familia silent around the, the pater familias and uh, um, looking at uh, uh, the ceremony, but uh, it is the only images I could find. I, I could not find one uh, linked especially to the birthday. Oh, right, okay. Are there any more questions for interventions? Because I think it's the sort of talk of uh, scenes of parties and celebrations that uh, make me think perhaps we ought to move on and um, we are going to I think have a, um, a drink and uh, I think uh, we've, um, we should uh, thank Ray Corbier who certainly deserved it for uh, giving us such an interesting fascinating glimpse of something um, that I think uh, is, is new to most of us. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Yes, yes, yes.